Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain. I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on how to solve your labor shortage problems right now with autonomous forklifts presented by Vecna Robotics. One quick housekeeping note before we get started, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, so audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many of them as we can at the end, time permitting. So just click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point, and uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So in any case, facing rapidly increasing wage requirements, scarce skilled labor and supply shortages, companies today are under intense pressure to find solutions quickly. Manufacturing, warehousing, and distribution facilities are all realizing that augmentation of the workforce with intelligent automation is no longer optional. It's essential for growth and longevity. So today, we're going to talk about that in a roundtable discussion with experts from Vecna Robotics. We'll learn how autonomous forklifts, tuggers, and other automated solutions have evolved from line followers to advanced and affordable free navigating equipment and why that matters for your bottom line now. With that, I want to introduce you to our distinguished speakers for today's panel. David Sofer is product management lead at Vecna Robotics. David is an experienced business professional with global experience in supply chain management, operations management, sourcing, strategic procurement, and purchasing. He's a project management professional with a diverse background and expertise in a wide range of business areas. Matthew Chiruka serves as Director of Business Development and Strategy at Vecna Robotics. He collaborates closely with Vecna's customers and partners in the application of cutting-edge automation to help the world's leading logistics companies understand and implement intelligent automation into their operations and business strategies. And Van Garrett is Director of AMR Solutions at Vecna Robotics. Van is a master communicator with a passion for developing creative sales and marketing strategies. For nearly 30 years, he has honed and proved his abilities as a visionary, creator, and driver of market share in engineering and robotics. He successfully started and exited two companies. So at that point, I want to turn, over, turn us over to the panel discussion portion of our presentation. I'm going to direct this first question to Matt, Matt Sharuka. How are recent advancements in automation able to help address current labor concerns? What do you think, Matt? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, and so I think for a lot of our audience out there, when they're thinking about automation, you're thinking about, you know, these massive structures of 20 miles of conveyor belts and these big robotic arms and everything. Um, and traditionally, you know, this is where the automation industry was. Um, and these were all turnkey systems that required a lot of planning um, careful execution and, um, you know, they were specced out to a fixed rate. Um, but what's happened um, in the recent years is that um, automation has become more flexible and adaptive. Um, and so you now have solutions such as, you know, collaborative robots and autonomous vehicles where um, you don't need to make these big uh, modifications to your facility. They're designed sort of to plug and play into your existing infrastructure, into your existing operations. Um, and they're also, I think the key thing here is that they are adaptive. So as opposed to always executing the same process over and over again, they're able to, um, you know, uh, in the case of picking robots, adapt to different SKUs and products that are coming through that maybe they've never seen before. In the case of autonomous vehicles, they're able to handle route changes and modifications to the way that your processes are operating. Um, and so this has resulted in these lightweight scalable systems that are much more accessible to the general market than they used to be. Um, and so with the labor shortages that we're currently experiencing, um, you know, robots, it, it's a cliche, but it's always the dull, dirty and dangerous, right? And so they're um, really focused on supplementing your existing labor force and handling all of the non-value add tasks that um, are kind of the day-to-day -day distractions to them and allows uh, you to, um, you know, do more with less, essentially. That's what these solutions are designed to do. Yeah, seems like a good fit. David, what do you think about that? What do you see? Yeah, I think it's, 
Yeah, I think what I'd like to add is that, um, you know, I think for me, one of the most important things are um, flexibility and scalability. And so we talk about flexibility, um, we're talking about, um, you know, peak season versus non-peak season. If you have a specific labor shortage at a certain amount of time, um, you know, you can add robots in or take them out when you need. Um, and also, if you have multiple sites, uh, you know, for example, within the U.S., um, at, you know, one facility needs more robots, one facility needs less robots, you can sort of mix and match. And the other part I'd like to talk about is scalability. So scalability is like, if you have a few robots, maybe you need to add one more, um, or maybe you, you need a reduction in your robot. So I think the ability to add or take away robots in different time periods at different facilities really is a, a key part in terms of addressing your labor shortage at a specific time, at a specific place in a certain way. Yeah, and also addressing just the very nature of the peak season nature of so much distribution. That's great. Van, what's your observation about that? I think some of the advancements in our technology stacks, right, in our LIDAR sensors and our cameras and things like that allows us now to be, you know, like free rain chickens, right? Free rain robots. We can run around. We can, we can move around in an environment where we're infrastructure free. We don't have to have lines in the floor or magnetic strips or things like that. And again, exactly what you know, Dave and Matt are talking about is flexibility, right? We're, we're at an age right now where you need to be flexible and your robotic fleet needs to be as flexible as the warehousing or manufacturing environment you're running in. Yeah, I, I, I love your description of the free range aspect of it, Van, that, that's, that's really great. I'm also interested in all three of you having kind of the implications here that this equipment today is, I don't know if I hesitate to use the word smarter than it used to be. I mean, old automation, you think of like picking arms or arms in factories that do one repeatable task again and again and again. That's all they do. They don't have any awareness of their environment. So really, you guys are telling me now about, about something that's way, way more sophisticated, not just what it does, but how it's aware of its environment. Would that be a, a good characterization? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, um, I'm going to direct this next question also to Matt and also invite the, both of you, David and Van, to, uh, to ob offer your own observations as well. But where can self-driving equipment be best applied to optimize operation operations? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a broad range of um, equipment out there, you know, um, bots as small as, you know, moving individual parcels all the way up to moving, you know, 10, 20,000 pounds. Um, and so you see a pretty broad range of applications everywhere from uh, manufacturing, distribution, even getting down into your e-com and fulfillment. Um, but uh, really the, um, all of the, the glue that kind of ties all of these together, um, as we talked about at the beginning, is that non-value add, right? And so you're looking for um, situations where you have a lot of A to B movement, especially with um, non-value add travel. Um, and so when you look at a manufacturing facility, for instance, a lot of time you see robots that are taking parts from the supermarket out to the assembly lines, moving, um, moving parts from one process to the next. And uh, then at the end of manufacturing, once things have been fully packaged, um, taking those and sorting them out to their appropriate outbound trailers. Um, and as you move that into warehousing, then you see something similar, right? Of pretty much anything from dock to dock, um, you're gonna see uh, mobile robots doing so that could be picking, that could be put away, um, that could be bringing materials out of storage over to like a kitting or um, a packaging area. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that um, robots are applied. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really focused on that A to B. Yeah, and I would add, um, in terms of optimizing operations, what we found with a lot of customers is, um, you know, a lot of customers are sort of hesitant to make a big investment into robots. They're not really sure if it's gonna work for them, but we, we encourage people to, to start with the easy things. Um, you know, prove that these robots work in your facility, um, and then you can get some visibility um, from you know, higher level executives, maybe across uh, the, the, the swath of different facilities, and you know, prove out that it works. Start simple and get, let people get used to it. And then this way, people feel more comfortable. So that when you keep adding robots to make more efficiencies, 
it'll get easier and easier to get buy-in from not only uh, you know, corporate executives, but also from the staff uh, at the facility themselves. So again, we, we would encourage people um, start, start easy, um, get buy-in, prove that it works, and then you can scale up from there. Yeah, the monotonous ta uh, tasks, right? The monotonous, repetitive, long haul, those types of things are a perfect place to start. Mm -hmm. Also, it's interesting what you're saying about the travel time being cut down. I mean, that's a huge deal. You know, how many miles does a typical human warehouse worker walk in a given day? And how many can be cut back with these things? So is that a real selling point, guys, do you think that, uh, you know, cutting back on actual human travel, these, you know, you know it is because of self-driving equipment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, building upon what David was saying, it, these seem like simple things, right? Of like, yeah, sure, the robot is driving long distances, but at the end of the day, um, literally tens of thousands of these robots have been deployed across all these different use cases by some of the largest companies on the planet. They're scaling them globally. Um, there's been, you know, billions of dollars invested into this area. And so these are these are proven solutions that bring value. Um, and as David was mentioning, you know, don't be afraid to um, find these quick, easy wins and then kind of build it up from there. Proven solutions. Interesting because outside the walls of the warehouse, all the talk in public about self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles, everybody wringing their hands over whether we've reached that point in technology. And here we are in warehouses and it's just it's become common practice. I mean, nobody questions the ability of these self-driving vehicles to achieve that goal. So that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, Van, I want to direct a question to you. Uh, let's drill down a little bit more into the weeds to mix a metaphor here for a moment. What does it take to deploy and operate the self-driving equipment? Also refer to them, of course, as AMRs, autonomous mobile robots. What's it take? Yeah, so not as much as you think, right? So the misimpression for everybody is that it's it's too expensive. Uh, they have safety concerns. It's too hard. It's a change in human behavior. Um, all those things are valid. Uh, but I would say after your first deployment, most of those go away. So the basic structure of putting a system in place is a map. Right? And every facility, no matter where you are, has some type of, uh, of CAD file. So, you know, when we look at taking on a deployment, it's as simple as you, you get that CAD file of the, of the facility and you designate exactly where those pick and drop off locations are, where you want to have those robots, uh, you know, manipulate uh, product. And then you lay your map on top of the existing CAD file that you have for facility. Now, I am really oversimplifying that. I am. But that's basically what you need. Uh, it, is, it is not as difficult as um, a lot of people will tell you it is. It's, it can be very simple. And deployments can go a lot faster than they did even a few years ago. Yeah, David, think... have an... go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I was just going to follow up with that is that I think, you know, historically, going back to the advances in automation, I think that these projects, you know, one, they took a lot of planning, and then two, the commissioning process would take, you know, weeks, months, maybe even a year sometimes to get these systems up and running. Um, and these new solutions really are designed to be much more kind of drop-in um, systems, as Van mentioned. So you still want to um, plan it out intelligently, right, in terms of like knowing what you want the system to do. Um, but the commissioning times are significantly faster. You get the value and the return from the system much faster. Um, and because you're not making any modifications to your operations or to your facility for that matter, um, it's a lot easier to get that adoption. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm talking to customers nearly every day. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people are concerned with safety, with IT security, um, you know, with rerouting things, maybe with even, you know, changing a workflow. Um, these, are, these are valid concerns, but we deal with these every day and companies like us are experts and helping you overcome these barriers. And the reality is that all of your competitors are doing this too. And you don't wanna get left behind um, in this movement towards automation. So whatever, um, you know, whatever item is holding you back, you think, oh, we can't do this because of X, Y, Z, we've dealt with all these things and, and companies like us 
have the solution, have the experience to get people started quickly and get moving with this. You say get people started. That's an important element as well. We've been talking about getting the equipment started, but with very few cases, if any, are we talking about warehouse environments where the people are gone? I mean, yeah. you've got these self-driving vehicles, they still have to interact with people on a regular basis. So talk to me a little about, guys, about the safety aspect, number one. You've, you've mentioned that, how these machines uh, ensure that. And number two, how do you train the people in the facility to begin working with these machines as quickly as possible? Yeah, so I'll start with safety. I mean, we our machines are um, obviously abide by the safety standards set in our industry, ANSI B56.5 and a variety of other um, standards. We also have third-party um, safety risk assessments as well. And so, um, you know, in terms of safety, um, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, haven't had any incidents. I think, you know, most companies are all uh, very concerned about this. And so when we talk with customers, you know, it's obviously a, a big thing in their mind. So, um, you know, we, we, we take all the precautions and that also translates into, you know, speaking with the people and getting them feeling comfortable around the robots. So when we, you know, companies like us and, and all, of, all of people in this industry, when we do a deployment, it's really about training the people on how to use the robots, how to work in a complementary way with the robots and not against them, and, and to, to really make them feel comfortable that, you know, this is the future, and um, they, they need to really understand that this is the way it's going, in, you know, in this industry. Yeah. Van, you have any any issues you think need to be addressed in that area? But no, I think that was uh, well said. I think one of the things that uh, we do as a company is we really look at uh, having those uh, the humans make a connection with the robots. We will have them um, name the robots. Uh, one of the videos may say Easy Money, right, was the name. I think that was one of the best names of uh, one mm -hmm. of the robots. Um, so it, it's inclusive, right? We want to include the people with the labor that is working with the robots in conjunction with them and not be afraid of it. And, uh, and we, we take that seriously and we put a, a significant effort into making sure that the, the entire customer experience is inclusive with the robots. Good point. Yeah. So and a lot of times these are also, um, uh, they're complementary to what the people are doing, right? So we have a lot of workflows where um, you're not quite um, having a full robotic partner, like, you know, in the sense that they're like coupled with you all day, but um, we might have a situation where, you know, an autonomous forklift brings pallets to you and then you as the like a uh, high reach operator putting pallets into and out of racks. And so at that point, you've got this collaborative workflow with the robots um, and then advances in the way that the robots navigate and behave, making them a little bit more human-like has also helped um, with that adoption curve of them understanding, okay, maybe there's no one on this piece of equipment now, but it's still, you know, making my life better. Yeah. We are talking about some pretty sophisticated technology here. I can imagine that a potential adopter of this technology would be somewhat concerned about the cost because a lot of these operations are not operating on very big margins. And they're thinking, you know, how is this going to affect my operation in terms of the investment I need to make? What is the ROI? So David, how is this autonomous equipment we're talking about today becoming more affordable to users? Yeah, Bob, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk about this because this is, this is something new um, and, and sort of it's a game changer in, in the industry, in my opinion. So traditional financing was a capital expense, right? Um, so you uh, pay a lot of money up front for the robots. Now, the advantage is you gain ownership of the item. Um, you know, and especially important if this is a long, useful life. Um, but the reality is that these, are, these robots, the abilities are changing, the hardware is changing, the software is changing. Um, so the downside, of course, to capital expenditure is you know, it requires a large amount of cash to, to buy these that you can't use for something else. You could get stuck with all the equipment. And the biggest downside to capital expenditure is it could take a year to get approval. And so if you want to automate right now, you might, you might have to go through the budgeting process and maybe you only get approval next year, um, but you need change right now. So one of the things that we've offered to our customers and many suppliers do this, is what we call robot as a service or RAS, R-A-A-S for short, which is sort of a take off on uh, software as a service, SaaS. And, and put really simply, 
this involves paying a, a monthly or an annual fee um, for, for the robots. And so what this fee typically includes is a fee for the, for the robot, uh, installation, deployment, which includes site configuration, mapping the picks and drops, and route fine tuning. Uh, it could also include shipping of robot. It could include um, a warehouse management system, WMS integration, or you know, ERP. Um, and it could include some of the accessories as well. So maybe a tablet, a barcode scanner, batteries, and charges for the batteries, tug or cart, even like that. Um, typically in a, a robot as a service model, um, in terms of the warranty, the, the major items are covered by the supplier. So, um, you know, powertrain, the autonomy kit, sensors. Um, consumable items might be uh, covered by the customer, things like uh, batteries or tires, but there's also a regular annual preventive maintenance included as well. Um, and so typically these, uh, these RAS uh, agreements are for a certain length of time, uh, maybe three years, maybe five years, and, but that's a discussion you have with, with your supplier. And so at the end of the time period, there's a few options where you can go with this. Is number one is you can extend the rental term and maybe you'll get reduced pricing because the hardware is a little older. Um, you could purchase the, uh, the robots outright uh, and maybe you get a discount again because you've been making payments for, for a few years now. Um, or alternative, if things aren't working out, you can send the robots back. Um, so, I, I mean, these are, part of the uh, robot as a service that, you know, again, companies like Vecna and others offer. So the advantages are huge for this. So you have less upfront cost, which means a reduced cost of entry. But one of the biggest things is you don't have to go through this year long layers of bureaucracy trying to get approval for this. You can get started immediately. You can even pay with a credit card. I mean, that's what people are doing these days. Um, Sign so me you up. Need <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so, so again, and, and the other, the other, you know, a couple other advantages are you can avoid having old obsolete robots because you can continually upgrade uh, over, over time and get better equipment. The software will automatically be upgraded for you. And so again, as I mentioned previously, like early in the call, this helps with flexibility, right? You can uh, try something out and see how it goes. And you can add robots, you can take away robots. And you can scale it quickly as well, um, depending on your locations and your time. Um, and of That's course, a, you know, the, um, the, 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 there's a couple of disadvantages, right? Which is that you don't own the equipment. So, you know, that's important to know. Um, but again, most people, they're okay with it. These days, people are doing monthly or yearly subscriptions for software, for, so, so for, for many things. So the key takeaway really in terms of, um, you know, doing robot as a service is, you know, if you haven't planned for this, you have staff shortage, you have an increased demand, you can get started really quickly. Um, and this, this robot as a service expense goes in your same bucket in operational expenditures as wages, salaries, and other equipment rentals. And so, you know, by reducing the upfront cost, you can save money to spend on other things. And my, my last point, and I'm not a tax professional, so I, I encourage you to, to, to consult your tax professional, is that the US government has a program called Section 179, which allows increased um, or, or faster depreciation on certain equipment purchases. So th there's, there, there's all these reasons to get started with robot as a service. Matt, you were about to say something, were you not? Yeah, um, I think, you know, for me, the biggest thing with RAS is that it's a bit of a mindset shift where you stop viewing this as an equipment purchase and it's more of an equivalent to labor, right? You were paying somebody 20 bucks an hour to operate a forklift and now you have a robotic forklift that costs, you know, like half as much or whatever it is. Like that's, that's just kind of the way that you can AB this and the way that you should be thinking about RAS is that you are now paying a robot to do labor and that robot is providing that labor for you. Great. Boy, what isn't available as a service these days, but in <laughs> robotics, it seems especially valuable option. So, I mean, I get the impression, I wonder if others get the impression too, that you get this technology regardless of how you get it. And you kind of lock in to that technology addressing your current state of affairs. But the real question here is, and I think that potential 
buyers would want to know, how can these so-called smart port lists drive continuous improvement of operations as opposed to just addressing the current state? Matt, why don't you address that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, traditional automation system, you know exactly what it's going to spit out. Um, the um, a lot of modern AMR solutions are, uh, you know, they're connected intelligent devices. And so this is more akin to an iPhone, right, of um, as time goes on, the more you use it, it's collecting data, that data gets pumped back into the system, uh, it gets better over time, it unlocks better performance, unlocks more features. Um, so like with our robots, for instance, we just had a, um, a major software upgrade this last quarter that increased the top speed of all of our robots in the field by 50%. Um, no hardware changes, no sending techs on site to do any field upgrades or anything. This is just an over the air software push. And there you go. The robots 50% better than it was yesterday. Um, and so when you invest in these new style of automation technologies, they're going to continue to get better over time. Um, but then they do provide additional benefits into um, visibility and then um, better efficiency of your operations. So on the visibility side, any mobile robot uh, is going to have some form of you know, reporting or analytics associated with this. And it can span a, pr a broad range of anything from, you know, real-time views of where everything is in the building and how the system is performing all the way up to, you know, really detailed historical analysis of heat maps of traffic patterns and where things were going and the whole nine yards. Um, so this gives people much more insight into how their operation is actually um, working than they typically had, you know, with a manual one. Um, and then the last part comes down to, okay, I have this automation system, but how does that plug in and fit in with all the other processes, right? You know, um, if you're only automating certain segments of your operation. And so a lot of these systems also have ways of coordinate with and orchestrating um, other technologies. And so you think about, you know, how is my robotic system going to interact with manual operations further down the road? I've got a robotic palletizer. How does a autonomous forklift speak with that? Um, and that's where these orchestration and coordination technologies come into play. Mm -hmm. um, and so combination of this being more akin to an iPhone model, um, giving you that visibility into your operations and then having software from these uh, systems that is specifically designed to interact with other parts of the operation allows you to keep evolving over time. Ben, as the big AMR guy at Vecna, do you think that continuous improvement is baked into the DNA of, of this technology? I do. I mean, it, it's like you tell your kids, the more you do your homework, the smarter you're going to get, right? So the more the robots do the work, the smarter they get. And it's such a treasure trove of data. We're, we're collecting so much data that a manually forklift operator may tell you who's going to win the, the, the ball game tonight, but the robot's going to tell you a heck of a lot more at the end of the shift. So there's so much data that's going way beyond just the work that is performing. And, and I just see that it's going to open up so much opportunity for everyone uh, in warehousing and manufacturing to be able to have useful data that's going to drive their, their uh, demand and, and do a better job. Yeah, in addition to, to smart forklifts, um, you know, we have a customer success team who's dedicated to, to the success of our customers. And so when we uh, deploy a robot with a customer of ours, you know, we stick with them for the long term. And so we are checking in to see how are the robots doing? How are the people doing? How are they working together? Um, you know, are the robots uh, being utilized to their full potential? And so this is a not only continuous improvement in terms of artificial intelligence and, and smart forklifts, but it's a continuous improvement um, of how people manage uh, these robots. And so we want to be with our customers for the long term, check in with them on a regular basis, ask them how they're doing, ask them, you know, where can we contribute? You know, are you, are you seeing a need here in this facility? Is there another facility we can help you with? And so really we want, this is a partnership between Vecna and our customers to continuously make their operation better and see how we can add value for them. 
Hey guys, thanks so much for those uh, really insightful answers to uh, my questions on this panel discussion. I think you covered all, pretty much all the basis of this new technology, but it's the audience's turn now uh, to ask questions. And uh, even as we are answering what has already come in, I do want to continue to invite the audience to submit questions by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And once again, we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time allotted. So uh, I'll start out with this one. I think I'll throw it to Van. Anybody else who wants to comment can uh, do so as well. But how do you map a facility and how long does it take? So it really depends on the manufacturer. There's, everyone's got their own uh, flavor on how they do it. But the simplest way you could do it is you get on the machine and you drive it through your facility. I mean, there's LiDAR sensors that are navigating through and looking at its environment anyway. So in most cases, you can jump on the machine, put it into teach mode, drive it through the facility and save your map and then designate the pickup and drop off locations. Now, again, there's the little nuances to that. There's certain things that we can use as tools to look at the turning radiuses to make sure that if you've got a trailer, we don't clip a, uh, a rack or something like that. But it's it's pretty simple. Yeah, you got it. David and uh, you agree? Yeah, I think it de it depends. Um, you know, obviously it depends on the facility. It it could take a day. It could take less than a day, half a day. Um, or if there's you know multiple buildings in a facility, it could take longer. But I mean, the key is you know companies, you know us and everybody in the industry are continuously making it easier and better uh, for for mapping. And so you know, COVID and the pandemic really. Um, sort of like ignited the spark to be like, how can we do this better, more efficient? Um, you know, and in the future, these things will be mapping and training themselves in the facility. But we're, we're not there yet. But we're going to be we're going to be getting there in the future. Well, and the the COVID point is interesting because um, I know at least um, we did a couple of remote deployments and remote reconfigurations with folks um, throughout throughout the pandemic. I think that's becoming more and more common as well. Um, so. Um, as Van mentioned, it's it's pretty easy to get started here and pretty quick to get that up and running. This next audience question addresses something that we already touched on earlier in this presentation, but I'd like to drill down a little bit more in terms of detail, and I think I'll direct it to Matt. Uh, the audience member is saying the question of follow-up. After the map is made, what should I expect after an automation system like this is installed? What training or expertise does my team need? Now, we talked a little bit about training, but can you be more specific about the training routine, how long it takes, what's involved, the type of expertise is, that's needed in order to get this thing off the ground and running really quickly? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we take a pretty holistic um, training approach, um, ranging from everybody from boots on the ground all the way up to you know, senior level management. Um, and we, we do that because we found that the change management is really critical um, to adoption. Um, and so there's everything from basic user training of what we had talked about earlier, getting people comfortable being around the robots, understanding the behaviors of how it's going to um, operate um, to the actual users of the robotic system, right? This is how you configure what you need the system to do. This is how you get work into it. Um, this is um, how you conduct startup and shutdown, the whole nine yards. Um, but then we do target, you know, operations um, leadership as well on, you know, um, robots, um, even though it looks familiar, right? It's a self-driving forklift that just doesn't have a person on it anymore. They do behave differently um, than a manual driver will. So uh, they know where every other robot is in the building, they have a little bit more contextual awareness and what's coming down the pipeline for tasking and everything. Um, and it's not always intuitive when you're used to how a manual operator drives. And so helping them understand, hey, these are the changes in the processes that are going to happen. This is how the vehicle should perform for you, giving them that visibility through the analytics and those monitoring tools. Um, all of this comes into play of helping people feel more comfortable with the system. Um, and then as David mentioned, we do keep that connection with the customer. Um, so we've got 24 seven, um, 24 seven helpline that's uh, waiting and available for customers if anything does occur. 
Is it, is it possible to generalize just how long the process takes before the uh, human workers in the facility are brought up to speed on in terms of working with these operations with these with this equipment? Anybody want to do take that? Maybe uh, Van. Do you yeah, have sure. I'll, I'll take. Oh, Dave. I, 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 I think I think um, you know uh, the answer depends, right? So it depends on how complex it is. So um, sometimes it could be a few weeks. Um, or sometimes, depending on the complexity of the operation, it could be a few months. But the, th the main point I sort of want to get across is that it, it's continuously like working together uh, with the customer and, and, and you know, going on, on their timeline and making sure they're comfortable and making sure their people are feeling good about what's happening there. So if we need to stop uh, um, for a day and, and do another safety training or, or you know, make sure people feel uncomfortable about how to operate around them, We'll do it. Um, you know, so it's it's really customized for, for every customer. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a good follow up question to that last question, and I'm going to uh, appoint Van to answer it. Uh -oh. How do you make changes to the forklift's map? It, well, it says if the facility changes, can we say when the facility changes? Because nothing yeah, sure. is in a, is in a static state anymore in distribution operations. So, how easy is it, and how do you do that? Uh, changing the map. Well, again, it depends on, um, you know, the manufacturer. Again, everybody has their own way of doing it. Well, it should be fairly simple. You update your map, you look at what those changes um, have have occurred, and you remap and you just make that that route change um, on the facility. It, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be anything that's earth shattering or takes, you know, days or weeks or months to do, you've updated the map. Again, we're talking about EMRs. That's the beauty of this. They're all naturally feature guided machines. They run on their own, the free reign. So the fact that that, um, that rack is no longer there or that machine got moved, okay, update the map, say, I can now make a tighter turn. Maybe I do a better job going through that facility. Maybe I've just increased my efficiency because now where I slowed down in this turn, I can now go faster. It's it's pretty simple stuff. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that you know every every customer is different and has their own uh, you know uh, level of expertise, right? And so if there's a customer who says, "Hey, you know, we got this. We know what we're doing," um, you know, maybe it just takes a quick phone call um, with with us to to coordinate if they want to change the map. Um, if there's another customer who's like, "Hey, we really just want you guys on site. We want you to be here." We, you know, we, we got to hold our hand a little bit. We'll do that as well. Um, so it, it's really catered and, and customized to each each client's need um, and, and the scope of the project. What it shouldn't be is a paycheck to that uh, service provider. Oh, well, you want to change mm. the map. That's going to cost you, you know, X number of dollars. It should be something that is easily, you know, done. And, and you know, you're not spending a gazillion dollars to make an update to your map. Yeah, no small print. Let's hope right, 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 about right, those right. extra charges that can really drive up the price yep. of, of, of technology. And speaking of prices, this next question is asking for a little bit more clarification on the issue uh, on, the, on the subject of RAS, robots as a service. This questioner wants to know, are all of the costs included in the monthly price and or are there, as we were talking before, other costs to budget for, David? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm happy to answer this one. So uh, the answer depends, and this is a discussion, uh, you, you know, with the supplier because there's all sorts of flavors you can do here, and and really it's it's pretty flexible. So I think for some customers, they say, "Hey, Vecna, we just want one fee. Include everything in the fee. We're gonna play one price per month or one price per year. I don't want any extras. I don't want any of this or that. Just one fee." And we say, "Okay, great." Um, and there's other customers who say, hey, you know, we just want, we want to pay for the installation deployment up front, get that out of the way. Uh, maybe that, that cost goes in a different budget, and then we'll pay the other fees, uh, uh, the other costs uh, on, on a monthly or yearly basis. Um, so, so again, you know, this is including things like, uh, you know, obviously the cost for the truck, uh, it could be installation deployment, um, there could be integration with the WMS system, and then you have your accessory is tugger carts, tablet barcode scanners, batteries and charges, chargers, things like that. But I would encourage uh, people listening to this webinar really to, to discuss this with the supplier and come to an agreement that feels comfortable for you. 
because that's really what's most important at the end is that the customer is feeling good and gets their customized, personalized solution for them. Okay, all well and good, David, but this next questioner wants to know what usually happens at the end of the lease contract if we or they use RAS. Yeah, well, hopefully things are going so well that you just want to keep going. And of course, that's an option, right, is to, to keep going either, um, either with the same hardware or maybe if there's been significant improvements or the customer and, and the supplier can agree, they can get new hardware. Um, so software, so for, for Vecna at least, software is continuously updated uh, as we push out new uh, features, new upgrades. That's always sort of happening. And of course, hardware is changing rapidly as well. So at the end of the term, um, we're, we, we see, um, you know, most people want to keep going um, with, with their, with their uh, RAS uh, agreement. Um, or some people, you know, really, if they're like, hey, this is going so well, um, maybe they finally got their CapEx budget approved after all these years of waiting. <laughs> they finally got the money. They're like, okay, we want to buy it outright. Um, and, and that's fine too. And so I think it really just depends. And that's a discussion. Um, but really, the, the thing is, people uh, between the, the customer and supplier should really know how things are going. And so over the course of the lifetime of working together, uh, for example, you know, at, at Vecna, we're, we're constantly working with the customer to make sure that the robots are, are, are suiting their needs. And if they're not, then we could change to a new application. We could move to a new facility. You know, we can sort of re, re, rejigger things to, to make it work for them. Um, so, so really, you know, we, we, there, there's, there's options, um, but, but the best thing, you know, ideally, obviously for the customer, if things are working and for us is, is to keep going with this. Yeah. But, but in times of uncertainty, like we're in now, flexibility is just everything. It's just the, the whole ball game. Yeah. So, um, we're running a little bit short on time. I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to ask Matt to uh, answer this one. How do we evaluate what equipment is best for my facility? Ask this questioner. Generally, how does my team start evaluating these solutions? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I think across the board, you'll find some fairly consistent answers of um, the biggest one being you want to start with multi-shift operations. Um, you know, you're going to get your best ROI the longer that the robots are running. Um, and uh, generally speaking, bigger is better as well. Um, if that's an option for you, um, the more square footage, generally the more travel you're going to save. Um, but at the end of the day, what you really need to do is start with a operational audit, um, you know, really going through your processes, understanding what are my pain points, um, where are there opportunities to both improve productivity that match with existing suppliers out there. Um, and, you know, as part of that, Vecna and most automation organizations such as ourselves, we have staff who have, you know, years and years of operational experience designing um, automation systems and evaluating um, these very same things for customers. Um, and so I would say don't hesitate to um, lean on that expertise and to reach out um, to companies such as ours. We're happy to provide um, happy to provide those evaluations free of charge because at the end of the day, as both David and Van have mentioned, um, you know, this is a partnership. Um, we are trying to solve your problems. And so let's, uh, let's find where those problems are and solve it together. It is truly amazing the level of sophistication and usability and for that matter, affordability that this technology has reached today. I wanna to thank our great panelists today. I wanna to thank David Sofer. Matt Chiruka, Van Garrett, all of Vecna Robotics for a fantastic presentation telling us what's going on in autonomous uh, robots in the facility today. You can learn more about Vecna Robotics. There's your information, there's a URL and get your definitive guide to AMRs. There's a second URL there. By the way, this presentation will be made available and sent to all attendees so that you can consult it uh, at your leisure. But uh, in the meantime, again, I want to thank our great speakers for today. I want to thank our audience for participating and for your own excellent questions. Everybody, happy holidays. Stay well. Have a great day.